It's the bomber that brought down an empire. B-29 effectively cripples the Japanese war effort. And ended a world war. Nothing like this had ever been seen before. Born to fly higher, faster, and farther, the B-29 Super Fortress redefined the role of aerial warfare. The B-29 absolutely pushed the envelope of what a combat bomber could do. And pushed its air crews to the breaking point. We lost some of our B-29s that day. From World War to Cold War, the B-29 is the bomber America depended on in its darkest hours. On its shoulders rested the security of the United States. June 1945, one month after Nazi Germany's surrender, the war with Japan rages on. Island by island, American forces grind towards the Japanese mainland. The casualties on both sides are severe. The U.S. needs a way to strike Japan's interior. To get the job done, the Army Air Forces look to its newest bomber, the B-29 Super Fortress. The B-29, it's the aircraft that revolutionized long-range bombing. Behind me is the B-29 Super Fortress. This aircraft was a marvel of engineering and manufacture and the most expensive weapon system of World War II. The B-29 is 99 feet long, nearly 28 feet tall, and its wingspan measures out to a whopping 141 feet. To get it off the ground, the Super Fortress relies on four massive piston engines. Well, these are Curtis Wright 3350s, and they're 2,200 horsepower apiece. So they provide a lot of power, but at a heavy aircraft like this, you certainly need it. These supply the 60-ton bomber with enough power to reach speeds up to 365 miles per hour. Combined with altitudes up to 32,000 feet, the Army Air Forces hope the B-29s can get in and get out before the Japanese even know they're there. June 5th, 1945. North Airfield, Tinian Island. A group of 45 B-29 bombers take off towards the Japanese mainland. Once airborne, the crew of the B-29 Sweet Sioux set course for the city of Kobe. Kobe was a big industrial city. The population is somewhere around 300,000. And we were aiming for the steel mill, which was in the south central part of the city. First Lieutenant Don Dwyer was a B-29 bombardier with the 9th Bomb Group in World War II. We know we're going to run into something. We don't know whether it will be flak or fighter cover. We had to depend on our gunners to, to take care of the fighter attacks. Luckily, the B-29's gunners are well equipped for the job. The B-29 is armed with enough firepower to make it an aerial fortress. Here I have twin 50 caliber Browning uh, machine guns. They're attached to a lower gun turret. We have an upper gun turret and several others around the aircraft that make this a formidable weapon system. 
The B-29's five gun turrets are located on the top, bottom, and tail of the aircraft. The four gunners and the bombardier can take control of the turrets remotely using the B-29's computerized system. This is the gun sighting device, and whichever uh, of the gun turrets I have control over, and that can vary, will be uh, connected to this device. And if I rotate it, that tilts the guns up and down. If I twist, uh, it'll turn the gun turret. As an enemy fighter approaches, one gunner can take control of multiple turrets. Using the computerized gun sights, the B-29's targeting system estimates the path of the aircraft and calculates where to fire. It was very well respected by the fighters because they knew if they got anywhere near this aircraft, they were going to get obliterated. As the fleet of B-29s reach the city of Kobe, all eyes are on the sweet Sioux. As the lead plane's bombardier, it's up to Dwyer to hit the target first. The rest of them then would trigger their bombs when they saw mine go out. If I miss, they all miss. Dwyer peers through his bomb sight and locks on to the steel mill. But as the B-29s prepare to drop, a swarm of Japanese fighters are waiting for them. Sweet Sue's gunners began spraying the sky with bullets. They'll need to keep the fighters at bay until Dwyer can release the payload. Well, I'm, I'm sure they were sitting there and saying, come on, when are, you gonna, when are you gonna release them? Let's get this over with. <laughs> Dwyer hits the switch and drops his 19 bomb payload. The other B-29s follow suit, hitting right on target. Everybody gave a sigh of relief that this was over with and let's get out of here. But as Dwyer looks up from his bomb site, there's a Japanese fighter headed right for them. We had a zero coming 12 o'clock. His intention probably was to ram us. Dwyer quickly grabs his gun sight and aims at the incoming fighter. I waited for his uh, wingtip to come into the circle and gave him one burst. His shots are right on the money. But the fighter gets one in of his own. He hit us with four 20 millimeter cannon shells. Two of them took out uh, two of the engines and the other one hit right over my head and knocked me unconscious. The firefight around Dwyer continues. Gunners aboard the Sweet Sioux knock down four more Japanese fighters before finally pulling away to safety. Back over the Pacific, the crew takes account of their damage. With only two engines still running, they won't have enough power to make it back to Tinian. When I came to, we were still at uh, 15,000 feet, but losing altitude, and we were afraid that we might have to ditch. High above the Pacific, First Lieutenant Don Dwyer's damaged B-29 struggles to maintain altitude. We knew we were going to have to contact Iwo Jima and make a landing there. The newly captured island of Iwo Jima is the halfway point between Japan and the B-29's home base at Tinian. The crew will only have one shot at a safe landing. 
we still had the two engines running, and the flight engineer said we had enough fuel to make it, but as far as altitude, we didn't. As Iwo Jima appears on the horizon, Dwyer radios down for emergency landing clearance. I said, either we're gonna ditch or we're gonna come straight in. So he's off for a bit. He said, oh, you're clear to go in straight. The sweet suit comes in low and hits the runway hard. They blew the tires on the left side and we're off the runway, but we were able to pull her up to the taxi stand and shut the engines down. Once we got down and we realized that we were safe, we, we were overjoyed at that point. With three confirmed and two probable kills, the crew of the Sweet Sioux has had one of the most successful run-ins against Japanese fighters in the war. But the B-29 was not always so deadly. Only two years prior, it looked like America's historic bomber might not even make it to the battlefield. September 1939. The world is at war. In Europe, Nazi Germany invades neighboring Poland, sparking unrest throughout the continent. In Asia, Japan is years into its own forced expansion throughout China. The United States remains untouched, but President Roosevelt knows America might be next. American military leaders looked at the possibility of allies falling. So they're looking at the weapons they might need if the United States is standing alone against Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. To counter the threat, America's bombers will need plenty of power and the range to deliver it. America's primary four-engine strategic bomber was the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress but they weren't capable of crossing oceans nonstop with a full payload. You needed a bomber capable of ranging upwards of 4,000 miles, staying in the air double the time of a B-17. December 1939, Washington, D.C. Army Air Corps General Hap Arnold puts in a formal request for a new far-reaching bomber. Arnold was a big advocate for building more airplanes, and one of his top priorities was this super bomber. The new bomber's request calls for an aircraft with a speed of 400 miles per hour, a 5,300-mile range, and a 2,000-pound bomb payload. Aircraft manufacturers get to work designing the ambitious new bomber. The Army Air Force's request absolutely pushed the envelope of what a combat bomber could do. There was literally nothing like this type of aircraft flying. May 1940, U.S. Army Air Corps generals unfurl the plans for the future bomber. Right off the bat, Boeing is the clear winner. Boeing submits its Model 345 design, which is the epitome of everything the Air Corps could want. It was streamlined. So it was an all-metal, modern airplane. And then you had the most powerful engines and the largest propellers ever used on airplanes up to that time. And it's not just the design's appearance that grabs their attention. It's what Boeing has planned for the inside. For the first time, a bomber will have a fully pressurized cabin, allowing crew members to withstand 15-hour flights at altitudes up to 32,000 feet. Above us is a tunnel which connects the pressurized cockpit across two bomb bays to the gunner's compartment in the back, which is also pressurized. 
The B-29's three pressurized sections fit an 11-member crew. In the front, a bombardier, two pilots, a flight engineer, a navigator, and a radio operator. In the back, a radar operator and four gunners. Because it was a pressurized aircraft, it allowed the crews to not have to be wearing oxygen masks continuously, to not have to be in heated suits continuously, and the other things that really were debilitating for the airmen. December 1941. The war finally reaches American shores. A massive Japanese offensive on Pearl Harbor thrusts the U.S. military into action. After Pearl Harbor, the U.S. military can't ignore that now they'll have to fight in the Pacific. The Pacific War is going to rely on long-range air power to beat back Imperial Japan. The outbreak of war for the United States dramatically escalates the orders of the B-29. It's 500 in January. By the spring, it's upwards of 1,500 orders for an airplane that hasn't been built, flown, or even tested by any pilot. It's the ultimate gamble for the Air Corps. For the next two years, engineers struggled to work out the kinks of the elaborate new bomber. It became a common occurrence during these test flights that an engine would overheat and catch fire. They would go up into the air, they'd have a problem with the engine, it'd overheat or catch fire. They'd have to go back down and land. Over the Pacific, American B-17s and B-24s don't have the range to strike the Japanese mainland. The only way that the Allies will ever be able to bring the war to Japan is with something like the B-29. Allied forces desperately need the new super bomber and time is running out. April 24th, 1944. After nearly three years of production, the first B-29s finally touched down in the Pacific. Less than two months later, 68 B-29s take off on their first mission over Japan. Their target? the city of Yawata, nearly 2,000 miles away. U.S. doctrine is precision, high altitude, daylight bombing. This is what's worked in Europe, and so they assume it will work just as well bombing targets in Japan. But when the B-29s reach 30,000 feet over Japan, harsh winds known as the jet stream hit the bombers head on. As their bombs are released, the strong winds scatter them off course. Out of the 68 bombers, only a single bomb hits the target. The jet stream was not well understood at this point in time. So this phenomena of air currents was a big surprise to the bomber commanders. The B-29s are going too fast. They're going too slow. It's hard for them to stay in formation. It's hard for them to drop those bombs in mass on the target. Mission after mission, B-29s continue to miss their mark, hitting targets less than 10% of the time. Being dawning upon the leadership that either the B-29s aren't ready or they, something needs to happen to make this performance improve. General Arnold decides on a major shakeup. For the job, he brings in one of the Air Force's best, Major General Curtis LeMay. Major General Curtis LeMay is 38 years old. He's experienced in combat in Europe. He's also got a reputation for being able to take new technology and adapt new tactics. LeMay acts quickly. He comes up with a plan to deliver a decisive blow to the heart of Japan, using the B-29s in a drastically different role. He dubs it Operation Meeting House. 
LeMay is going to unleash a strategic bombing firestorm, the likes of which no one has ever seen. And the B-29 is the weapon to do it. March 9th, 1945, Tinian Island. B-29 crew members pack the base's briefing room. LeMay's new strategy is a complete break with traditional Air Force doctrine over Japan. Bombers will now not only be flying at severely low altitudes to avoid the jet stream, they'll also be doing it in the dead of night. The switch from day to night, from precision to area bombing, and flying from high altitude to low altitude is a complete transformation of the bombing campaign over Japan. But LeMay's new strategy comes at a great cost for crews. To save weight for larger bomb loads, B-29s are stripped of their guns. I think my father, like probably thousands of other guys, was thinking we're going on a suicide mission. Doug Carter is the son of B-29 left blister gunner, Sergeant William Carter. Instead of bombing from 30,000 feet like they had been, they were gonna be bombing on this mission down to 5,000 feet. And they weren't gonna be carrying any ammunition. So they felt like they weren't gonna be able to defend themselves. The B-29s are loaded with a new type of payload, incendiary bombs. Each 500-pound incendiary contains 47 napalm-filled bomblets. LeMay hopes the fires will turn Tokyo's wooden buildings into an inferno. LeMay wanted to inflict the maximum amount of damage. He wanted the Japanese to realize that he had the capability to totally destroy Japan. Sergeant Carter and his crew will be flying aboard God's will. At 6.20, the crew takes off into the setting sun, joining more than 300 other super fortresses headed for Tokyo. In this mission, they were not flying in formation. They were flying at night, so it was basically every crew for themselves. The B-29's only eyes in the dark will be their state-of-the-art radar system, the APQ-13. Many of the B-29s had a radar installed, and it would be between the two bomb bays in this center wing section. It would be a ray dome that would hang down a few feet and would allow the radar dish to point toward the ground for navigation and targeting. The radar is carried on the bottom of the B-29's fuselage. Using super high frequency waves, it emits a series of pulses towards the ground, relaying the signals to an onboard radar screen. There's a nice advance in technology that uh, brought some safety to the missions and allowed them to do some bombing just by radar. Approaching Japan, the crew of God's Will waits for the radar signal. But the image stays blank. The only thing they were getting out of the radar for the most point was watching the sweep hand go, illuminated sweep hand go around the dial, but they weren't seeing anything on that dial. So they were basically flying blind. The crew will need to identify Tokyo purely by sight instead. After being lost over Japan for more than an hour, God's Will finally spots Tokyo in the distance. When they got approximately 80 miles from Tokyo, they could see the fire. Dead noted in his diary that it looked like the whole world was on fire. It's clear the bombers have finally displayed the devastating potential of LeMay's new tactic. The bombardier aboard God's Will pulls the lever and the B-29's 24-bomb payload drops. 
adding to the inferno. General LeMay characterized the mission later as the turning point in the aerial war against Japan, and in all likelihood, the turning point of the entire war in the Pacific. B-29s destroy nearly 16 square miles of Tokyo in a single night. The success of Operation Meeting House validated LeMay's tactics and it led to the escalation of firebombing raids against the rest of Imperial Japan. Over the next five months, B-29s rained fire down on Japanese cities. By the end of July 1945, Japan was in an economic, political, and industrial shambles. But there was no indication that the Japanese government was going to surrender. And so there was a belief that an invasion of Japan had to happen. Hoping to avoid an all-out invasion, newly sworn in President Truman decides to up the ante. So planning for the invasion of Japan was moving forward rapidly, but the US had one more very secret option, and they needed a special B-29 to make it work. July 16th, 1945. New Mexico. American physicists unveil Truman's top secret weapon, the atomic bomb. Its first test proves to be disturbingly powerful. President Truman hoped that by dropping the atomic bomb on Japan, it might convince the emperor and the military leaders of Imperial Japan to surrender. Only one plane is capable of carrying such a weapon, the B-29. The Army Air Forces initiated the secret project, Silver Plate, to modify B-29s into atomic bombers. The Silver Plates are made faster, lighter, and with enhanced bomb bays, capable of fitting the new atomic payloads. All that's left is delivering them. August 6th, 1945. A silver plate B-29 takes off from Tinian, carrying the world's first atomic bomb. Six hours later, it's released over Hiroshima, Japan. The results are devastating. A whole city demolished by a single bomb. With no word from Japan on surrender, the US decides on one more massive show of force. August 8th, 1945, Tinian Island. The B-29 boxcar is selected to carry a second atomic bomb. Because my father had flown the instrument plane on the Hiroshima mission, he was chosen to be the pilot and the commander of the second atomic mission. Marilyn Sweeney Howe is the daughter of Major Charles Sweeney, pilot of the boxcar. Truman's bluff was really to indicate that we had a whole arsenal of these bombs, although, of course, we only had the two. Boxcar's payload will be a 10,000-pound plutonium bomb known as Fat Man, equal to 21,000 tons of TNT. Fat Man will be even more powerful than the blast at Hiroshima. In the early hours of August 9th, Boxcar pulls onto the runway and takes flight. The second atomic bomb is on its way, this time headed for the center of Japan's war industry, the city of Kokura. Seven hours later, 
the B-29s arrive over what should be their target. But as the crew looks down, all they see is a thick layer of smoke. A nearby bombing run the day before has left the city of Kokura completely shrouded from view. When they got pretty close to the release point, the bombardier turned in panic and said, I can't get a sighting. I cannot get a sighting. And their instructions were to drop that bomb visually. It had to be a visual drop, no radar whatsoever. Without a clear shot, the B-29s are forced to pass over the city. So Dad thought to himself, well, there's nothing I can do at this point except make a second run. Boxcar turns and heads back towards Kokura. But this time, they've got company. At this point, flak started to come up, fighters started to come up, and they still could not get a visual sighting. After a failed second pass, Sweeney turns once more, determined for a third attempt. Not only did they still have an atomic weapon in the belly of the plane, they kept looking for that open spot in the smoke, and it was not there. With no luck on the third pass, the boxcar is now out of time. Sweeney banks away from the city, heading south. Kokura is saved by a smoke cloud. The B-29s instead set their course for their secondary target, Nagasaki. But their fuel reserves are already becoming low. They could probably make it to Nagasaki, but only for one run. That would be it if they were going to get back and land that plane successfully. They had one shot at Nagasaki. As they reach Nagasaki, the conditions aren't promising. Instead of smoke, the city is completely covered by clouds. As they were approaching Nagasaki, they were wondering, what are we going to do now? With no clear visual, they'll have to do an emergency radar drop. My dad said he would take responsibility for a radar drop. They only had one shot at this, and that was it. There was no other choice. However, just as he was approaching his release point, all of a sudden, the bombardier said, I've got it, I've got it. I have a visual sighting. And my dad looked at him and said, you own it. The Bombay doors opened, and Fat Man was released. A bright flash of white pierces the sky. Dad said that the, the blast was just absolutely beyond description. The cloud was coming up. This big brown cloud was rising and rising and rising. And he said it went past them at 30,000 feet and kept rising. The crew has no time to linger. They still have one major problem. Their fuel gauge is now running dangerously low. Without enough fuel to make it back to Tinian, they'll need to make an emergency landing on the nearby island of Okinawa. With engines coughing and propellers slowing, Okinawa comes into view. Sweeney drops toward the runway, hoping the engines will last just long enough to keep them airborne. The flight engineer told him that the fuel gauges were reading zero at that point. As boxcar descends, one of the engines dies from fuel starvation. The bomber slams into the runway, and Sweeney pulls the emergency brake. 
the B-29 screeches to a halt. A very ex intense, absolutely most dramatic landing that he ever wanted to take in his life and he never took again. But he got them down safely. In the course of only three days, two bombs have wiped nearly two entire cities off the map. The destruction is impossible for Japanese leaders to ignore. On September 2nd, the Japanese government formally agrees to an unconditional surrender. Above, a fleet of B-29s make a victory flyby, now enshrined as the bombers that ended a world war. After the war, the B-29 is riding high. The B-29 is now the star of the early U.S. Air Force in the media post-war period. It's used as a record-breaking aircraft for long distance. It's used as a platform for developing in-flight refueling procedures. And it's also being used as the primary aircraft to drop more atomic bombs during the Bikini Atoll tests in 1946. But the U.S. isn't the only country with nuclear ambitions. In August of 1949, the Soviet Union detonates its very own atomic bomb. With the Cold War now in full swing, the U.S. quickly finds itself facing off against a global superpower. The B-29 was America's only nuclear bomber. On its shoulders rested the security of the United States in deterring a nuclear attack from the Soviet Union. And in the summer of 1950, the Cold War suddenly turns hot. In the midst of the tensions and struggles of the Cold War, an outright war erupted, a conflict between the free world and the communist world in which the B-29 plays a very important role. June 1950, backed by the Soviet Union and China, communist North Korea invades the democratic South. The U.S. and its allies are completely unprepared for this invasion, but the U.S. decides it has to make a stand against communism and make that stand in Korea. The Air Force quickly deploys its B-29s in defense of the South making quick work of the North Korean supply lines. But in November of 1950, North Korea unleashes a deadly weapon of its own, the MiG-15. The Soviet designed and built MiG-15 introduced a turning point in the skies over Korea. It was jet powered. It was highly maneuverable, and it carried cannons that were easily destroyed to be 29 in the air. The MiG-15s were better than anything we had, the British or the Americans. First Lieutenant C.J. Christ was a B-29 combat pilot in the Korean War. The MiG-15 had such a, a speed advantage, an altitude advantage, that they were very difficult to hit. Stationed along the Chinese border, the MiG's limited range keep them from reaching UN strongholds in the south. But North Korea plans to change that. The communists were continually trying to build bases where they could attack the South Korean forces. With airfields further south, the deadly MiGs will run riot over all of Korea. The B-29s need to keep the MiGs inside China if the Allies are to have any chance at winning the war. October 22nd, 1951. Kadena Air Force Base, Okinawa, Japan. B-29 crew members scramble for their upcoming mission. 
North Korean forces have begun construction of three new airfields south of the Chinese border. It's up to the B-29s to make sure they're never finished. One by one, B-29 crews take off, each armed to the teeth with 40 high-explosive bombs. Five and a half hours after takeoff, the B-29s approach their target, Taishan Airfield. But the MiGs are already on their way. When the uh, reconnaissance aircraft call trains leaving the station, then it's probably going to be five or six minutes before they're up there with us. B-29 gunners anxiously scan the skies, waiting for any signs of trouble on the horizon. Almost immediately, a formation of MiGs break through the clouds from above. First thing we know out of the sky comes these airplanes that we could hardly even uh, track with our guns, much less have a chance of shooting down. A lone MiG unloads its cannon on Crist's formation. The antenna was shot off of our airplane. That's how close they came to hitting us. The MiG instead scores a direct hit on the lead bomber's engine, right as it's dropping its payload. If we're behind him, then he loses 25% of his power. That's just like throwing a parachute out there almost because they slow the airplane down quite a bit. Christ frantically pulls back on his throttle. If you're coming up on Bob's away and you're 50 feet under the leader, you could slide under him a bad place to be at Bob's away. Just in time, Christ slows down watching the trail of bombs narrowly miss his aircraft. We're maybe 75 feet behind those bombs which are dropping. We're quite relieved to see that he missed us. The surrounding B-29s drop their own bombs, pummeling the airfield below. As far as I know, they never did actually complete an operational fighter base in North Korea. Every time they would start a, an air base, we would bomb them, and they couldn't finish it. But Air Force leaders see the writing on the wall. It's clear the age of the jet has begun, and the B-29 can't keep up. The Korean War was the beginning of the end for the B-29 as a combat weapon. After the war, a new generation of jet bombers began to roll off the line. The B-29 has a legacy in the airplanes that follow. As airplanes are developed further through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, they look like a B-29. It was the world's first nuclear bomber, a title that will live on through the ages. It's the bomber that won the war against Japan. But one that bears a heavy burden. That this was a weapon, a weapon in which Americans died in, and a weapon in which Americans destroyed cities with. Despite being in combat for less than a decade, the B-29 lives on through history as one of the world's most iconic aircraft. <laughs>